I think it was 22 years ago the first time I came to the Meacham. And uh, that was uh, winter of 1988, and I was so happy to be here. And I have to tell you that I had the feeling um, when I came that it, had, that it existed for 50 years before that. It had a very solid, completely established feel to it from the very beginning, it seems to me. And thanks very much for having me back, Rick and Sybil. Uh, I'm going to go back uh, with a story also. Um, the title of it is 40 Martyrs. And I've written a collection of interconnected stories. I call them novel and stories called 40 Martyrs Suite, S-U-I-T-E, as in a suite of stories. And this is the anchor tenant. I wanted to tell you about this. When I won the Flannery O'Connor Award, this was a 40-page uh, story that was in the back of the, that was the kind of the closing or the capstone of that collection. And it was uh, taken out of the collection because it made the book too long. And so I knew that it was going to be the anchor tenant of the next book. Um, and I, um, so I started shopping it around. It hadn't been published. And I, uh, I sent it to uh, the New Yorker. I sent everything to the New Yorker. I sent every story raw as it was, first time, first to the New Yorker. And I sent it. And um, this would have been about 87 or 88, something like that. And uh, I had a person at the New Yorker that was reading for me whose initials I only knew. They were DM, DM. And I was happy to have that because then when I would send to the New Yorker, I was always send to DM. I felt like I had a foot in the door. Um, you know, uh, any hope in a storm. And I, uh, so I sent it. And it was a rather involved story, and I had cut it down so that it had a chance at the magazine. And um, I got a very nice note back um, from Roger Angel, and it said, um, we like this, there's an awful lot going on in it, maybe the next one. And that was a very happy uh, rejection slip for me in those days. And I just kept up the hope for 40 Martyrs, and I kept up the hope, and... I decided about six years later that it came so close to the New Yorker, I would just send it again. <laughs> and so I changed the title to The Lies We Tell. And I um, sent it to um, a woman whose name has just gone out of my mind right now. Somebody in here will know her name was Deborah. She's a poet. Uh, I sent it to her, I knew her, and uh, I thought I had to bypass DM and Roger Angel, of course. And it wasn't long after that, that this was six years after, I received a, a rejection slip from the New Yorker that said, we didn't like this any better this time than the last time. <laughs> and I have wondered what that filing system looks like ever since. So finally it did fine, it, uh, and um, your bio of me here is a little off, so I want to, 40 Martyrs gives me an opportunity to correct that. I've never actually had a story appear in Best American Short Stories. This story was backlisted in American Best American in 1995 and 100 other distinguished stories. That was my appearance in Best American. I'm always very careful to word that, but after people paraphrase it a few times, it sounds like I was really in there. I, I was in the O. Henry's. Um, so here's 40 Martyrs. I'm just going to read into it a little ways, uh, as long as time will allow, and you'll get sort of the flavor of really my entire collection of interconnected stories, 40 Martyrs. Oh, it's the name of my Catholic parish in my hometown. For a lot of bigger towns, one martyr's enough. 40 Martyrs. After Carol Brown's husband got tenure, so the story went, he became depressed. He gained weight and grew a beard, which came in gray. He would brood in his study, fishing through scraps of old scholarship he'd intended to publish, 
Carol would hear him in there taking, uh, talking to himself. Sometimes he'd raise his voice, but she couldn't understand the words and she wouldn't linger long by the closed study door. Gradually, too, he withdrew from his traditional involvement, Stephen's Cub, House, Cl Cub Scout projects, Becky's toddler gymnastics, which he'd been so enthousi enthusiastic about helping her with, poker on Wednesday with other members of, members of the history department, a tradition uh, since forever. In fact, most of all, uh, most all of Wally's relationships at the college fell apart soon after he got tenure. At the core of all this was an inexplicable anger, rising by the day like another spirit emerging from within him. And of course, during this time, Wally and Carol's marriage itself, dying for a long time, finally came down to the last. He found a separate place to sleep most nights, the couch he salvaged from his parents' house when they moved to Florida, or the recliner in the family room which had come with the house uh, when Carol uh, bought it. Mornings, he would go off to the college before anyone else in the family was up, and on many evenings, he wouldn't be home until after supper. Often, by the last, he wouldn't even sit with the kids over their homework, but instead isolated himself in the backyard, pretending to be absorbed by some home improvement project he would never finish, or in the dim, dusty study with the door closed. Without a word, he would pass Carol in the hallway or on the stairs. His moods were erratic. Most of the time he was withdrawn, but once, mysteriously mad about something, he smacked Carol hard on the face in front of the kids. Once in a store in the mall in Champaign, he began shouting at her angrily, apparently because she was taking too long. The other parent patrons looked on in shock. And Carol heard stories of similar behavior at the college, Wally shouting down students at a convocation, Wally angrily shoving the assistant registrar one afternoon, roaring at the department secretary who placed his mail in the wrong box. All that, it turned out, was prelude. After uh, six months of steady deterioration, on Sunday morning in the midsummer, when he should have been relaxed since he was finally tenured and the summer session was over and he could claim time for himself, he snapped completely in a sudden outburst of seething rage and confusion. He attacked Carol and in a horrible, bloody struggle, stabbed her literally within an inch of her life and was carted off shortly thereafter to permanent residence in a maximum security manic depressive ward in Vandalia. Carol never understood what happened. A year later, coming up the short, curving sidewalk to Forty Martyrs Catholic Church, still dressed in her yellow jogging suit after the morning run, Carol had one of her periodic flashbacks, this one of Wally's second lunge at her. It had come in from low, upward toward her face, real personal. She turned her own shoulder into the blade to protect herself. She had a friend with whom she used to correspond before he stopped writing. He was a veteran, and in one of his letters, he hauled out his most terrible uh, ghostly memory from the war, about the time he had to call in artillery fire on his own unit when his position was being overrun. Thirty-nine of some sixty were killed. She had the letters in a bundle hidden deep in the crawl space under her house, safe. That particular letter came to mind when, for no reason, as sometimes happened, she suddenly recalled turning her shoulder into the knife. You do what you've got to do. Not to compare her shoulder wound to the deaths of 39 young men, but anyway, this morning, she suddenly saw a parallel. Her morning run usually took her south to the highway from her house, then along Route 36 to the university, then up the campus sidewalks to the railroad, and then across the Eisner parking lot. This morning, she re uh, she returned, she stopped at the church because Father Kelleher had called her and wanted uh, her to drop by if she could. Forty Martyrs Rectory was a block-shaped house in tan bricks matching the church next door. The drapes and shades were pulled. The front porch was a grotto of sorts, 
with a small pond, a statue of the Virgin, many hanging plants now neglected, and what was once a fountain, now dry and cracking up. She rang the doorbell. Father Kelleher's dog, Bliss, woofed lazily on the other side of the door, and Carol could hear the, uh, his, her choke chain rattling. She pictured the shy priest at an upstairs window, slanting the shade to see who was there. But instead, immediately after she rang the doorbell, the door lurched partly open, and she could see his eyes through a crack, right at the level of the taut chain from the chain lock. It's me, she said to him. It's okay, girl, he murmured, his whisper dry and raspy. Glad to hear it, said Carol. No, I, I meant the dog. He closed the door to undo the chain, then opened it wide. Oh, you knew that, he said. He hesitantly smiled fondly, too. He liked Carol and seemed to understand her. He was clearly happy she was there. He turned to lead the way, waving his heavy arm for her to come along. Come here, lass. I got to show you something. Tell me what you think. She closed the door and followed him. Although Keller had been to her house many times, she hadn't been in the rectory since uh, he took over the parish the year before. She and Wally often visited when the previous priest was there. Now the place had become a cave, smelling a little too heavily of both man and dog. The dimness of the room seemed to spread to the furnishings themselves, dim off greens and st stained and dusty browns. The ceiling light in the hallway was dimmed by a collection of dried moth carcasses silhouetted by the glass cover. The ceramic floor had a gritty feel under Carol's running shoes. She kept thinking she was tracking something in, but looked down and saw her own tracks in the dust. Kelleher was too private and embarrassed to have a housekeeper, too sick and moody to do it himself. By now, it was so far ahead of him, the job probably seemed intimidating. You got here quick, he said. His voice was low, since she wasn't sure if she was even intended to hear. He cleared his throat. He was fully dressed, all in black, in the white Roman collar with the Jacket shoulders dusted in a sprinkling of oily dandruff, and although he was fairly young, perhaps sixty, he walked slumped like an old man, his large, heavy feet shuffling as though he were bone-tired. His thick, yellowish-gray hair was slicked back and matted. Bliss, a large, ancient Irish setter, was had scaling kin, skin, too, lumbered behind him wherever he went, pausing sometimes to scratch or nip at her tail. The police are coming, he said. He walked ahead of her through the foyer and up the hallway. Should have gotten here before you did, I don't know. The police? Well, yes, it seems I've been robbed. Now his voice shook, and in the added light from the office windows, Carol was able to see that he was upset. The office has been ramshacked. Ramshacked. <laughs> um, the safe door was visible under uh, uh, the uh, open bookshelf. On the desk, the lamp was overturned and broken, and papers were covered the floor. The desk drawers had actually been thrown, slammed against a wall opposite the desk, and one was in splinters um, at, the, at her feet next to the door. Carol saw incongruent things in her moment of looking, a black rosary and some dice, an old Bible and a Sports Illustrated, a small plastic model airplane, and an aged apple core. I got up at the Angelus and said Mass before I noticed this. I came back over and found it. I was so mad, Carol. I thought someone had done it while I was over at the church. He wiped his face with his jacket sleeve. They had the place cased, it seems like. Yesterday I was in Springfield seeing the bishop again. They must have known. He seemed short of breath. Maybe they were here when I got back last night, right here in the house with me. He reached under his coat toward the back and pulled out a pistol. I've got this if they come back. His voice was shaking. Carol thought the gun looked like something John Wilkes Booth might have used. Old, oddly shaped, like an old cap gun. But she could see actual bullets in the fat cylinder at the center of it. She tried to think of something else. She stepped into the debris of the office and automatically moved to set the desk chair back up on its casters. Let's leave it, he said, his free hand coming up to stop her. There may be fingerprints or something. She left it. 
Bliss was panting in the hallway, her chain clinking on the ceramic tiles. Some stuff is gone. I can't tell what. A couple of relics from the parish centennial. Small, important things, you know, that, that you collect over time. He said this with a smile, but painfully. He looked at her as if she might have an answer. She didn't. Yeah, okay, let's go in the other room so we don't touch anything. I got to sit down. This business is making me dizzy, something terrible. He walked ahead of her as he talked, not looking back. He was carrying the gun in his right hand, holding it limply with the muzzle, pointing mostly to the floor, except when he would gesture with his hand and Carol would see the barrel flash by. She noticed that his gun was actually, his uh, finger was actually on the trigger. In the living room, he half gestured with his gun hand toward the empty TV stand in the corner. They got the VCR too, of course. I hated that thing anyway, given to me by the Knights of Columbus. The VCRs are all I lost from here, I think. The VCRs, all I lost from here, I think. Sitting room seemed to be even dingier when he clicked on the table lamp. Its shade closed at the top by a haze of cobwebs. The room had two enormous windows completely closed off by heavy dark green drapes. I thought this kind of thing only happened in cities, he said. I'll quit there, and thank you very much.